Hi, welcome to Hard Boil Synthesis, lecture 24. I'm continuing the write-up phase of the catnip meta-analysis. If you're just catching up, oh boy, there's a ton of videos for you guys to watch. Um, but if you're new and you just want to get some idea on how to write up a meta-analysis, I think today might be a good chance for you to learn a few tips in um, reporting the method section for a meta-analysis. And the method section is by far the most detailed, intricate part of the whole write-up. And I'll just uh, say it right from the start. When you begin writing this stuff, don't sweat about length at this point. It's important that you are totally clear and transparent about every single thing you did. No shortcuts. Report all the decisions you made. Um, this will save your keister in the end because um, if your end point is to publish, um, having things very clear and all laid out makes it much easier for a reviewer to make decisions and evaluate the quality of your study. A uh, super easy way to get a uh, rejection or negative reviews is to just uh, skip the reporting of certain details on how you found studies, what databases you searched, uh, how you extracted effect sizes, all that stuff. And so I'm really going to cover all that today. Clearly I can't write the entire methods section. Again, with the last lecture, you know, I made this point many, many times. Writing is iterative. You do things over and over and over again. The methods section is something you will come back to over and over and over again. My advice right now, get everything on paper. Um, and I'm going to present some structure here to help you out. Um, and, and then flush it out. And then later, if you're constrained on space, then you can make decisions on whether or not to throw things in an appendix or uh, uh, abbreviate uh, abbreviate or uh, contract sections. Leaving in the key details, but maybe using a, a shorthand to describe those things. There's kind of already a bunch of shorthand tools out there to help you. For example, the Prisma flowchart um, that's something that you could put in the appendix, or sometimes it's even something you want to present in the main manuscript, in the main uh, publication. It essentially is like a flow of uh, information of how you searched and how all these outcomes were screened, dropped along the process, leaving a collection of effect sizes that you uh, synthesized. That's kind of a shortcut to writing. My preference is to have all that in text, but if you have it all nicely laid out in a flowchart, then in the text, you don't need to repeat those details. Um, I don't have much of an opinion on that other than whatever approach is easier for you, as long as all those things are reported. <laughs> I mean, that's really the key part. And so again, <sighs> Phase two of the write-up, we got the methods section. I got my Word document right here with a really awful introduction. Again, it's just like a, you know, a fart <laughs> of ideas. Um, but I had, I've been, a, I'm a day removed from that last lecture, and I've had a little bit more time to think about what I want in the intro. And this first sentence here is really something that's been. Uh, bothering me a lot. It's a bad way to lead an introduction. And I thought more like, what is the point I want to make with this lead sentence? So on social media, pervasive claim is repeated. Catnip is 10 times more repellent to mosquitoes than DEET. I think I got that quote wrong. I need to get the right quote. The one that's kind of disseminated often. Um, but what do I mean by this? And I would save myself so much trouble writing this manuscript if I just pretended as though I was solely interested in synthesizing catnip as a repellent. 
I mean, I could have just, that could be the uh, motivation I write on in the manuscript would be like, catnip is used often, here's the synthesis. Boom, that's fairly straightforward. But I want an honest lead. I want more than just me providing a summary of lit literature. I want to have my motivation up front. My motivation is like, all right, to show you guys some, a way to do a research synthesis project. But the, the hook to that was the catnip repellency against mosquitoes. And my motivation was to address these um, social media claims. A catnip is 10 times more effective than DEET. And so I thought more like, why, why is that, why is that a bad thing that this claim gets bounced around so much? And I don't, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know, but I was, I, I remember teaching ecology a few years ago and thinking about, you know, why, why it's so hard for climate change to, uh, to get consumed by the public in a positive way. Right, the public gets exposed to media, gets exposed to uh, social media, doesn't get direct exposure to science, to research, to to the primary lit. I mean, to read that stuff, you need a high degree of technical understanding of how science works, of how science is reported, of how stats works. I mean, there's so many layers. That's why it takes so long to train scientists. It's like the socialization of all these barriers leads to someone who can understand all these things. Uh, but the public is just like, you know, they're doing, they're living their lives. They, they haven't spent, you know, five years training on how to understand, understand experiments and, and publications and all that kind of mumbo jumbo. Where was I going with this? And so with the climate change stuff, I know there's a huge, uh, literature out there trying to understand like why people are so hesitant to adopt open understanding of that this is like this thing that's occurring and um and so i think i should revisit some of that stuff revisit some of that stuff so that i have like a better a clearer way to pitch this first sentence right that the idea is like um I don't know, I'm probably not using the right words here, but the public consumes science indirectly through social media. And, and that makes them extremely sensitive to um, overstated claims. I think that's what's happening here. Um, maybe, let me put that down. That's actually all right. Overstated claims on plant derived repellents. Okay, no, no, this is good. Just talking stuff out is helping. Overstated claims on plant derived repellents can impact risk of ex exposure to vector born diseases is that how you write born probably not it's telling me okay there we go <laughs> um, vector born diseases because because they oh i'm already screwing up they i'm just trying i have a stream of conscious going on here i'm just trying to put on it because they may apply repellents with inadequate pro evidence base and protection Ugh, this still doesn't quite. Overstated claims. Okay, yeah, yeah. Overstated claims on social 
media. It's probably, is it really just social media? Yeah, okay, I'm calling Twitter. Clearly it could be Facebook. Facebook is like one of these things, right? Where people just share information. Oh, let me tell you something. This is, this is totally in line with this. So on Facebook, I shared with my family the video that I made on, uh, I forget what lecture it was, like 13, 12. The video I made on uh, the origins. No, no. The video I made where I first started synthesizing with like a legit random effects meta-analysis, all these studies on catnip propellancy. And, and I, you know, I start off the video with like, I'm skeptic that the catnip is a repellent. And then I end the video with like, holy smokes, folks. Catnip is as effective as DEET, right? That was a, that was, I should not have done that. Um, because like my family, they watched it on Facebook. No, no, no disrespect to my family. They're good folks. <laughs> They're great folks. Um, but then they watched the video and they were like, oh man, I'm just going to stop using DEET and I'm going to use catnip. And why, why would they walk away with that conclusion? Um, because I failed. I failed in providing context in what I was doing in that single video. And I followed up with many um, heterogeneity analyses. And I clearly showed that catnip is full on inconsistent to the point where it's just like, it's unpredictable when it actually works relative to deep. Right, so, so just that small video, me talking scientifically, right, using meta-analysis jargon and analyses, just kind of went over their heads, right? If you're not trained in this, this is just mumbo jumbo, but they 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 um, they really respect my word. They really respect my opinion on things because I have that training, I have that experience. And, and so I end it with like the positive claim of catnip. And now they're like, next summer, I'm going to use catnip. It's going to be awesome. I failed. And so, and so I want to address some of this stuff in the manuscript. That's why I feel like this is like a, um, an important thing for me to cover when I summarize the, the, my motivation is, you know, this is kind of an activist study because I want to minimize the risk associated with like these overstated claims. <coughs> Over, okay. Overstated claims in social media on plant derived repellents can impact. Okay. So this is like to me, this is really me overstating the purpose. Like I know a lot of these catnip, studies they um they justify some of the research based on the type of mosquitoes the species the mosquitoes so like this is the mosquito that is the major vector of plasmodium that's why we study it that's why we want to figure out an effective repellent against it um but but the reality of the study is it's not really testing whether or not exposure vector exposure decreases because of the repellency um, that's a totally different type of evidence. What they're doing is like jumping ahead of the gun. And if they're saying, yes, catnip does repel, then that might repel the vectoring mosquitoes and thus downstream limit exposure. And so I feel like these statements are super strong, right? But, um, but I'm going to keep it here for now until I figure out some other way to describe this. So I kind of like the, the way this is kind of set up gelling in my head right now. I really need to start reading that literature on like um, claims, scientific claims that get diffused in the public and how they receive it and how they consume it. Um, and so I think that's the hook I, I want to, to hinge my study on. I mean, I'm at a stage in my career now where I could explore these weird, <laughs> weird avenues to uh, report findings. Again, making it my life harder when I could just straight up just describe, hey, 
Catnip is inconsistent. I did a synthesis. Boom. Done. No. I want to talk about, you know, societal impacts. I don't know if that's the right way to say it, but... Okay, I was supposed to talk about methods. <laughs> uh, all right. So, methods section. Let me just go on a new page. So, again, clearly, I cannot write an entire methods for you guys right now. But I've written enough of these things to know what to hit on. And so what I'm going to do now is just like provide structure. And I think there's a, typically there's a seven or eight paragraphs, you know, to reduce it to a numerical value again, there are seven or eight paragraphs that a, a meta-analysis typically has. Um, and all of these correspond with the phases that occurred in uh, findings, uh, searching for studies, retrieving them, extracting data, analysis, and so forth. Basically, the way the course is structured, right? We hit on every one of those stages. So, so technically, every one of my videos should have a collection of sentences that describe what I did in those videos, in those lectures, on, on the manuscript here. If I would have followed best practices, at least my own philosophical approach to writing, I would have written all those decisions already. And I kind of started doing that with the course, but because of time constraints and over uh, uh, me being kind of silly and forgetting to do stuff, um, I'm really behind in this thing. Ideally, right now, all this would already be written if I would have just followed my own personal uh, goals when I typically do a meta-analysis. Uh, but I have not much. I do have like a little paragraph written at the beginning. I'm not going to look at that now. Right now, I, I want to present you guys structure. And basically, we're going to follow all these phases and then uh, add sub-phases to each of these uh, major uh, achievement benchmarks in the research synthesis process. First one clearly is searching. Search screening uh, retrie retrieval maybe. That's sometimes part of the screening effect sizes extraction uh, moderators analyses one two three four five six okay so I think this is um, you you would essentially have a one paragraph or more or subheadings these many subheadings in your methods right and you want to hit on all of these to be absolutely clear in what you've done Many things, okay, so let's start from the top, search. Um, what are the main things we want to describe in the search? Um, I like to start the search methods with what was, um, what, uh, how do you say it? Um, the intention of the search. Like what is your, what is the target group of things you want to find? Intention of search. So in my case, I cast a really broad net. If you remember, I searched for uh, studies that tested catnip as a repellent. Not even uh, excluding um, other taxa or limiting my search to mosquitoes. I wanted to see the entire uh, corpus of studies using catnip as a repellent. I'm glad I did that at the end because I identified a bunch of... Uh, um, reviews and um, neat studies that are appropriate when I start flushing out the, the manuscript. And because I was totally naive with the research, right, that was one way for me to pull up my socks and start getting exposed to uh, important publications associated with the discipline. So my intention of research you know, I'm not going to fill this in now, but it was uh, to identify, to find all the studies testing catnip as a repellent. Uh, what, what database
right? What databases did I search? I just searched the one database. And so, you know, I don't win the badge of systematic review because I didn't do all these um, systematic searches to find stuff. Again, deviating from best practice. Typically, I would actually do a more elaborate search on hitting many multiple databases. Uh, important things to hit on the database stuff, though, is um, uh, date of search, uh, source of search. And try to be as detailed as you can with those things, right? I searched a web of science. Okay. That is the minimal piece of information you reported there. That's, you want to be more clear in what you did. I reported, I searched web of science using my University of South Florida, a library um, account. My library, um, a subscription to Web of Science, that, that might not be the right word, um, has these 11 databases. It sucks reporting all that information in the, in the methods, but um, right, right now we're not concerned about length. You just want all the information in there. Again, to save your keister, when it comes to the review process, because all the information will be there, a reviewer will be like, hey man, you did not do the search. You didn't report things adequately. It slows down the pace of how this stuff gets out. Okay, data search, source of search. Um, oh yeah, keywords, <laughs> of course, you wanna report keywords. Don't, don't write out the keywords in like a phrase structure, in a sentence structure. Like I search for catnip, comma, repellent, comma, and all the studies that, and, uh, and additional search terms. Don't do that. Just copy and paste your actual search terms that you used. Right. Put these under quotations. Um, follow it with a colon. Right. Here are my search terms. Colon. And if you got booleans in there, put the booleans in uppercase. That way, the reader knows. Okay, these are the search words. These are the terms used by the database to narrow or broaden the search criteria. Um. Okay, this is a, a straightforward. And then finally, search outcomes. This is stuff that would end up in the uh, Prisma plot, right? I did a search using these key terms. I found 300 cities. That's what you report right here. Bonus points if you report the actual composition of those studies. Um, 299 were uh, journal publications. 65 were abstracts, published abstracts, uh, 10 were patents, and seven were in um, German and not in English. All right, screening now. Uh, all right, so screening This is where you describe your inclusion, exclusion criteria. Just have it right off the bat. I, my goal is to screen studies and identify those that test um, catnip, any kind of catnip, right? The plant the compound, the plant-derived compounds, the isolated compounds, anything associated with catnip, 
to as a repellent and i don't i don't care if it's a mis, if it's a mosquito or a uh, a beaver or you know i don't know what else a giraffe right i the idea is to sh to indicate to the reader that you were selective in some way now the exclusion stuff gets complicated because like yeah you're going to exclude things that um don't use catnip. I mean, for some reason, catnip may be described. Um, this is where I would kind of squeeze in information on uh, different terminology associated with catnip. Sometimes it's called catmint, right? I was inclusive in all those um, variations of the word. Um, this is where you also describe your screening design. Treat the screening process like uh, you would an experiment, right? You're, you're doing a practice here, and the goal is to get a, a high-quality outcome. Describe to me how you achieve that high-quality outcome. Um, ideally, you know, you would use a dual screening design. You'd have more people making uh, screening decisions on the same material that way you amplify the confidence of um of screening decisions this is where you would report some of those uh concordance stats i did a dual screening design and reviewer one and reviewer two uh, agreed x amount of time you would include information on how you resolved conflicts I did not do any of that stuff. It was just the lone me who screened stuff. Um, so, uh, and of course the tools involved in screening. Did you use Excel? You, did you just screen at um, studies uh, visually with just Excel or did you use like a little um, GUI screener like we did with metaphor. What did you screen, right? Key here, titles, abstracts. Often enough, these tools, um, you know, they're designed to streamline the screening process, limit what you, what information you get exposed to when you're making those decisions. You do not want to expose yourself to the journal, the year, the authors that might introduce biases in your screening decisions normally you just want the title and the abstract to make those decisions um, does the tool provide enhancements to facilitate the screening in my case you know keywords were were highlighted keywords were highlighted to help me screen those decisions <sighs> all right so and then finally of course what was the screening outcome you started off with 300 bibli inf bibliographic information on 300 studies you ended up with 100 that uh, fit your inclusion exclusion your fit your inclusion criteria. Uh, something I missed with the search is you may want to um, de duplicate talk about de duplicate dupli dupli <laughs> de duplication. Sorry to and then tools associated with that. I, I did not have to worry about that because I um, did a web of science search. However, again, web of science is searching multiple databases. It is doing some deduplication on its own in the back end. So this is why sometimes you do you get like um you know a thousand your search hits on a thousand uh, studies, but when you download it, it's like nine hundred eighty four. What happened there? It it deduplicated some of those. As at least I think that's what they do. It's deduplicated some of those uh, search outcomes. Okay, screening outcome. Whew. 
Oof, we're getting there. Slow but steady. Retrieval. Now, the retrieval is often sandwiched with uh, screening outcomes. And retrieval is like a success in retrieving main text, which can be mixed. Um, and so this would be another aspect put into the Prisma plot where, you know, you identified 100 studies, 100 candidate studies, but you were only able to get the main text of 97 of them. Report it here again. Make it very clear to the reader that some things you could not retrieve. Now, if you had unlimited resources and energy, chances are you might be able to retrieve these things. But often enough, you just got to move on. And maybe later on, if you have time and, and, and or these studies appear, then you, you could include them. Like, for example, at the university, at uh, University of South Florida, I could make requests at the library to find some of these things. And sometimes it takes them weeks or months to locate a copy, a digital copy of something. I mean, you can't pause your project for months waiting for the one thing that may or may not actually have information from your study. And so here, this is where you would write the part where I just had to exclude studies um, that I could not retrieve for many reasons. And I think there's just, it's a one-liner here. Okay, so the next part here is the um, effect sizes. Now, the um, conceptual proper transition would be, I retrieved all these studies. I then extracted data from each one of these studies. Um, but to me, that's always kind of backwards, right? So the, what you should do now is, I found all these studies. Now here is my operational definition of an effect size. Here, and then follow up with, here are the data I extracted from the studies um, with my effect size in mind. I mean, this is a personal preference. You don't need to, uh, clearly you don't need to follow that. The idea is I report my effect size early on, right? What's the nature of my contrast, which makes it easier for me to report like what I, what I searched for in each study because I now actually described the data that I'm going to be reporting in the meta-analysis. So with effect sizes, right, flat out, whew. I am just butterfingers today. I provide my operational definition. Definition. So for me, um, my operational definition of an effect size is a, a contrast between a repellent response with DEET and repellent with response with catnip. Okay. And then here's how you calculate that effect size. So you got your operational definition. Let me just, uh, followed by the equation. Always fully report the equation you use to estimate your effect size. Remember, there's mixed terminology out there in what these things are. You could avoid any um, ambiguity, ambiguity, <laughs> um, by um, by just flat out putting the equation. That way there's no, even if you re give it the wrong name, the equation is there to provide it at what exactly was achieved. Equation, both effect, size, and variance. Variance is key to meta-analysis because you they act as the weights. Um, okay. And of course, you need to define all variables in those equations. Um, define all variables. And then, and then there's a, like a nice logical flow to you define all the variables. The variables are the summary stats that you extracted, right? Then you go into your extraction. Um,
All right, so then you you talk about the extraction phase, right? I already described to you, Hand, what I want out, out of an effect size. Now, how did I get those things out of each paper? Um, description of, uh, what do you call those? Um, imputations, conversions, all equations, always report the equations, right? And so like, for example, you, you're gonna need to do some weird stuff at some point to extract numerical values from your studies. Uh, in my case, right, a lot of uh, outcomes were reported as um, odds ratios. I needed to convert those into hedges D. This is where you would squeeze in that kind of stuff. Uh, what tools you used for extractions? Right, so like if you extract the data from plots, cite the tool you used. Um, this is also an opportunity to squeeze in a secondary exclusion criteria. Um, studies reported outcomes um, in terms of predefined effect sizes, right? I had to exclude a bunch of studies because they reported things in percent uh, protection, which is its own metric. It's a own metric that is already including details about the control and treatment group. But there's no way to separate the control and treatment group when it's reported as an effect. And because that effect is not something that's conventionally used in meta-analysis, it's impossible for me to integrate it in my study. And so this is where it would follow. It would be like um, studies reporting effects in terms of percent protection, I had to exclude because there was no way for me to retrieve uh, those summary statistics that I need to compute effect sizes. Feel free to watch that video. I think I kind of beat up the plant repellency studies way too much about these metrics. I got to I got to I think I'm talking too much, but I think you guys are getting the point. And then finally extraction outcomes. Okay? How many effect sizes were you able to uh, compute from all these studies? I mean, I feel like that's sometimes a number that it gets uh, forgotten in in reporting stuff. Or, um, typically, what happens is you, you pull out a ton of summary stats across all these studies, but there's a percentage of which where you were unable to compute an effect size. That's where you would put that here, for the many reasons. They did not report standard deviations. You decided not to impute those standard deviations, and so all those studies get dropped. You would, you would sandwich that at this part. Uh, all right, let's move on to the next paragraph or section, whatever you call these things, moderators. So for a systematic review part, this would be the coding criteria, the classification criteria, the um, ways you categorize group studies, right? You're pulling out information from each study in hopes to classify, to group them, to maybe place them in a hierarchical structure um, based on similarity. Um, so that you can make identify gaps in meta-analysis terms, use them to make predictions on uh, variability across effect sizes. So the moderators here is like fairly straightforward. Um, what else did you extract from studies? Okay, these could be numerical uh, continuous predictors. I extracted the age of mosquitoes when reported. I extracted the temperature of experiments when reported. Um, continuous or categorical. Continuous is fairly clear. Um, report 
common currency conversions, right? For me, a hiccup in all comparing all these repellency studies is that they reported um, studies with various dose concentrations or dose measures that weren't easily cross uh, convertible. Um, I would squeeze that in here. There's some of the issues I had with uh, converting these things in a common uh, metric so that I could use them as predictors. Categorical. Um, classifications what was grouped with what okay so often the goal of it you know having categorical predictors is that you have groups every study cannot be different because otherwise you you would break some of these um, multiple regression assumptions by having too many um, groupings in, within your factors. I mean, there's a limit to how many groups you could have relative to your sample size, relative to the number of effect sizes you uh, compare in your analyses. And so typically your classification of moderators aims to simplify those groupings and where you group like what like. So in my case, you know, there are many um, arm and cage trials, but there was a lot of variations in those arm and cage trials. I just grouped them all into arm and cage. There were many variations in choice assays, right? Y tubes or these little petri dish type um, vesicles for mosquitoes. I lumped all that stuff together because they were choice um, experiments. I need to describe those decisions I made. What is getting grouped into this? What do I mean by an arm and cage trial? We're here, for example, every study that reported this, 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 this style of experiment was classified as an arm and cage trial. This is also where you throw in operational defini definitions of predictors. Okay, um, experimental design. Every time I talk about experimental design as a predictor in this meta-analysis, I mean this. I mean different ways in which trials were performed. Right, this is where you would squeeze that in here. If I'm talking about um, uh, class of response measured, I mean that I'm talking about um, how different outcomes were reported within studies. Were they reported as contact rates? Were they reported as um, um, mosquitoes, mosquito attraction, and not so much mosquito landing, right? These are uh, small phrases you use to classify, to describe the, the classifications. You would define that all here. And so when you have your plot of like this moderator predicts these um, effects this, this way, somewhere in the manuscript, there's an actual definition of what that moderator is. Best practices, you would also have that squeeze into your figure caption. Figure The figure should itself be like the, an island in the paper where you don't have to refer to anything other than the caption to understand what's plotted. Um, but it's nice to also have a, some redundancy, some repetition of that in the methods section. All right, one last group. I mean, look at all this stuff that you need to fit into your methods, right? Well, how many items we got? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27 so far points you need to hit in your method section to have a, a really just like simple description of the meta-analysis. Like I haven't gone into super detailed uh, reporting practices. This is a, you know, 
you didn't do anything fancy and so you're just reporting simple things but sometimes you end up doing a really fancy meta-analysis and you have to report all those details analysis wise this is where it gets gummy is um whenever you do a fancy analysis you spend a lot of time describing the model you used in our case i'm just using vanilla random effects meta-analysis right but I always report the full model full meta analysis model right be explicit um, my model includes the rand the between study a variance component of a random effects model i threw in some predictors in that model now it becomes a mixed effect meta analysis i guess i haven't really described the difference between that jargon but Every predictor you throw in to a meta-analysis, these are uh, fixed factors. And then on top of that, you have random factors included in your analyses. And so combined, you get a mixed effect meta-analysis. Ooh, this is so silly. So silly to describe all that stuff. Report the full model. Bonus points if you actually report the, um, the, reg the uh, regression equation, right? How these things add together in a formula. That way we kind of have a really clear vision of what, what is being done. Describe all random components. In our case, you know, there's just the one, the between study variance, but now it's super easy to throw in a bunch of other random stuff for random at the study level, random at the effect size level, level. Um, whole bunch of non-independence modeling practices you need to describe every one of those components and bonus points if you actually describe the numerical estimation values of those variance components which is something that rarely gets reported in meta-analyses i will report all that stuff because to me that stuff is interesting okay finally of course the tools in used in performing analyses right did you use metaphor did you use open me did you use revman you know there's a ton of stuff out there report the software you used i feel like this is not something that is inadequately reported in studies but you got to give credit to the people that developed those tools i mean a huge amount of time is spent pulling that stuff together to make it easy for you give give them credit i mean just think of how whether or not you could achieve the project at all without those tools or how it would have slowed down the entire process if you did not have these tools give the authors the credit okay uh definitions of statistics reported this may seem like a weird thing but a lot of people out there a lot of reviewers out there are not totally familiar with the conventions and reporting practices of meta-analyses you can't just say report a bunch of q tests in your meta-analysis without without defining what it is i mean i've seen this happen many times where it's undescribed and people are reading this and like what is this what is that and it's nice to give it like a what a Q test is analogous to. Q test is analogous to an F test from an ANOVA style analysis. Some readers are like, oh, okay, I understand. This is like a grouping test. You're not using the Q test in that way. You're using it as a heterogeneity test. Describe it that you're assessing heterogeneity using a Q test. Um, describe all the Z scores. That you report like where did that originate from these are contrasts between regression coefficients or are they contrast between effect size groups report 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 all those knickknacks and then finally in terms of analyses you got your publication bias tests or sensitivity analyses, right? So you start with like the big model of your stats and then you follow through with, well, I establish confidence in these stats 
by doing these um, publication bias tests or sensitivity analyses. All that needs to be reported. Um, publication bias analyses, you know, my opinions on that are all over the place. <laughs> Uh, but a reviewer will ask for you to do it, even if you provide like a five paragraph, five paragraph justification for why it's inappropriate for your meta analysis. They will still say, where's the Eggers test? And then you'll report the Eggers test and they'll be like, you found publication bias. And then, and then you're, you know, I'm just talking about personal experience here. They're like, you found publication bias. I mean, I'm like, yes, but did you not read that there's like five paragraphs describing that perhaps this test is not appropriate and here are, are all the millions of reasons why. Did you not read that part, reviewer? Reviewer number two? <laughs> yeah, okay. And then finally, is that how you write plotting? Report your plotting tool. Um, did you use like an, a, uh, a package in R that estimates effects, um, effect factors for you? Um, did you use an R package that provides the contrasts for you and then help you plot those things? Report all that stuff, man. Don't just say I did an analysis using metaphor. <laughs> Come on. Tell me exactly what you did. You're following best practices, you need to report that. Estimation procedure for the random effects variance component, right? Did you use like a maximum likelihood approach? Did you use a restricted max, maximum likelihood approach? You know, that kind of stuff. Report all that stuff. Go a step further, bonus points. Report the optimizer involved in those estimation practices. That's kind of nice. <laughs> I mean, my advice is just Throw it all out there. Don't leave anything ambiguous. If you try to do stuff ambiguous, I mean, it just, you prevent people from really appreciating all the hard work you did. That's really what the end point of that is. It's like, a, you want to be clear because it provides a lot of information to the reader, reader that what you found is um, of high quality. Now, maybe some of these practices that you approach are deviate from what would create a high quality meta-analysis, but at least you were upfront and describe your limitations. And then the reader could just take it as at face value and be like, all right, so they were not able to do a phylogenetic meta-analysis, right? For these reasons. Okay. Um, we could move on from that point and and, and continue with the reading of the meta-analysis. It doesn't need to be like a, a break point in, in um, interpreting the quality of your meta-analysis. Okay, so look at this. Look at this beautiful, beautiful, endless list of what you need to pull together when you're writing a method section for a meta-analysis, right? And so for me, I'm going to do this off camera. It ends up probably being like four or five double space typewritten pages. Um, more so if I throw in the equ equations, which I will. Um, and so there you have it. These are the things you need to hit on when you're pulling together a meta-analysis methods. This is, this is the, you, you need to spend a lot of time being clear with this stuff to save some trouble later. I mean, if you did something goofy, put it on there. You know, if you made some weird decisions at some point, put it on there. Don't, don't try to obfuscate what you've done. It just slows down the progression of your synthesis overall and how it gets published because you were just kind of vague, vague in your practices. You'd hate for like that to happen where it delays for months and months the publication because you, you keep bouncing back and forth with the reviewers where the reviewers will like want all this material uh, where you could have just done that beforehand. Save everyone some time and just pull it up, pull it all together. <laughs> all right, all right. Um, it seems like I got a lot of work ahead of me. 
Um, again, thanks for uh, hanging out and um, enjoy your weekend. Take it easy.